Well, we're delighted to be here and uh, very grateful to have a, an opportunity to serve in this church. And, um, you know, a year is a long time. And uh, I can understand how you are getting very desperate that you would choose me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, God has his way. God has his way. And uh, it wasn't anything that we were really looking towards or anticipating. But uh, when we were able to meet uh, with the church about a month ago and be here, we just continued to sense uh, God opening the door. And so we're very delighted to accept this this opportunity. Um, I, I won't be speaking long today, uh, and I, I hope that that's okay with you. I won't always make that promise. I have to tell you, I love to preach. Uh, it's, it's what you do when you go into Can you imagine a doctor who says, I really don't like to heal people? That's not my thing. You know, okay, so this is, this is a, a big part of what I do, and I like to talk about the Lord. I like to talk about Scripture and great things that God is doing. But, you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, probably uh, speak for the full two hours I was planning. I'll, I'll pare it down, maybe an hour 45, and we'll be good. It's so important that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's pray right now. God in heaven. There's been many prayers, many offerings and songs and welcomes today, but just at this moment, we acknowledge you one more time. We pray that you would add your blessing to this part of the service, Lord, that you, you would be the one speaking and be your voice that's heard here today. We've come to honor you more than anyone else. We've come to worship you. We're all in this family together, Lord, and we're all on that journey that is the symbol that I appreciate so much. So, God, come into our hearts, come into our minds, and bless us today. Whether we're here physically, or whether we're watching online, wherever we're at, Lord, please be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of these days, I will explain a little bit more about my name. I know some people get a little confused. Do they, is it David? Is it Dave? Is it Davey? Um, and uh, even the spelling is a, is a little off, and I understand that. And I'll, I'll give you the reason. There are reasons for these things. Don't blame my mom. Uh, there are other factors that come into place uh, in my life. I prefer Dave. I've, I've gone by Dave um, since I was about nine, and I, even when I greeted uh, Charles, and Carol said, oh, no, what are you doing? That's, uh, nobody calls him that. That's, uh, you know, a parent. When I hear David, I look for my mom, you know, so I, I prefer Dave, and, and the spelling is unique, I know, but uh, again, someday, uh, I can't give you everything about me, you know, right now, but uh, I'll explain more later. We've had a great week being here in Scottsdale. We're not moved yet. Uh, we just came down for this week. We're doing some house hunting, some paperwork, uh, got our, our kids to meet uh, some of the staff on campus, uh, get to know their new school. And it's, uh, the weather has been very mild. Thank you for praying about that on our behalf. And uh, just enjoying the area here and getting to know it. We go back tomorrow, and we do appreciate your prayers for us as we, we um, will move the first week of August, and that takes some time. So be patient with us. If I'm not you know, in the office day one and, and taking phone calls, um, call George. That'll work just fine. <laughs> Actually, I think it's great that you've had such... Uh, very stable leadership um, during this time. Uh, you, uh, you have a great team, it sounds like. I'm looking forward to meeting uh, the rest of the team and, and the elders and, and others that are, are uh, part of this church leadership structure, and we're just going to be a great team together. You may recall when I was here, um, has it been a month? Was it a month ago? This has been so fast, uh, how quickly this has all transpired. Uh, it's hard to believe. So yeah, I was here about a month ago, you may recall that I do have a little bit of a tradition, or you may even call it a routine when I preach, and I like to have a little bit of interactive time with young people in the congregation. I call it Kids Quiz, and uh, normally uh, I would have a microphone going around, and I'd actually call on kids that want to participate, and they'd answer, and answer into the microphone, and everyone can hear whether they're listening at home or here in the, in the congregation. But under the circumstances, it's something that's going to be a little bit just more, um, you know, rhetorical. We want the kids to just answer to themselves, maybe answer to their parents or, or family that's by them. But it's just a way to begin the service and having that moment with the young people. No, it's not required. 
uh, no arm twisting or anything like that. Um, but I, I enjoy it, and it's just become kind of a habit of mine. So here we go. Question number one. If you're listening and you want to participate, um, what is the golden rule, and where is it found? It's often hard for some of the adults sometimes. They want to shout it out, and that's okay too, but usually we like to let the, the kids have a first go at it. I'll give you a hint. It's found in Matthew seven twelve, And, oh, Ketsia, you know it? I think I heard it, and it was sounded wonderful. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? We, we grew up, we know that. That's something that we learn at a young age. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Jews actually taught that verse differently. They taught it, don't do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so Jesus, when he's speaking to the, to the people, he's using some of the things they're familiar with, and he twists He says, let's turn this into a positive. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, the second question is, do you know what the rest of that verse says? So Matthew 7, 12, if you, if you, if you have um, memorized, do unto others as you have them do unto you, that's actually only half the verse. Do any of you know what the rest of that verse says? See, now I see some of you, you're getting, what is he, what? Is that true? Do you remember it? Ah, yeah, you had to cheat. You looked it up. <laughs> For this is the law and the prophets. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Jesus says, I can sum up for you the entire Old Testament. That's kind of uh, a New Testament way of referring to the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And Jesus in this one statement says, I can sum up every part of the Old Testament for you right here and right now. It's this idea alone. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, of course, there's more that we could parse out of that. And there's a much more intended in that that God wants us to understand. But we're going to move on here. I have five questions in my quiz. So this is number three. What one word, according to the Bible... What one word fulfills the law? Is it obedience, faith, righteousness, duty? What one word fulfills the law? If you're in, I'm sorry that I can't see you at home. I hope that the kids are with you at home. I hope this is a family event that you guys are gathered in your living rooms or wherever you're comfortable um, sorry that I can't see you, but if you're a young person here and you think you know the answer, would you just raise your hand for me? What one word fulfills the law? Some of you are not so young wanting to raise your hand too. <laughs> All right, either you're shy or we've got some work to do. Yeah, It's the word love, isn't it? Multiple places in the Bible you can find that, but it's, it's uh, particularly in Romans 13.10 where uh, Paul makes it clear it's also in Galatians 5, 13, and 14. All right, number four, what does Paul say is the greatest spiritual gift? And you think, oh, what does that even mean, spiritual gifts? You know, there's like leadership, and there's prophecy, and there's preaching, and there's even the gift of tongues. I was raised Pentecostal. It's pretty important in that uh, context. But what does the Bible say is the greatest of all gifts that God has given us? Spiritual gifts, they're called. Do you know? I'll give you a hint. It's the same answer as the previous question. Yeah, it's amazing. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. He says it again in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Okay, are you with me? You kind of see the flow, the direction that we're going. One more question, and I look forward to when we can have this be a little bit more interactive. We'll see how that goes. But Jesus said this, in John uh, 13, 35, Jesus said, By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By this. This is one of those statements that, you know, he's just wanting to make it very clear. No parable here. No analogy. He just makes it very clear. By this, all men will know that you're part of my team. That you're one of my disciples. Do you, do you know what he said there? By this, what is the this? Is it because you obey? That's it. Because you pray, uh, because you give your tithes. That's, that's important. What is the thing that Jesus says, by this all men will know you are my disciples? If you have love for one another. 
Did you see kind of the theme here? I, know, I hope this doesn't sound very hippie-ish to you, very 60s, you know, love, just love, and everything's going to be great, man. You know, actually, you know that the counterfeit is always very close to the genuine, right? It wasn't that the hippies really had it wrong. It's that they defined it by human standards rather than by God's standards. I hope there's no hippies I'm insulting right now. I love history, and I, I like to see how it informs the present and even how it gives us guidance for the future. Love is the umbrella that guides all of what we are as a people, as instructed by Jesus. We truly live in crazy times. These are chaotic times, very contradictory times. Things that we thought at one time were very free and open. We're now being told that, you know, you, you can't do these things anymore. I experienced a contradiction, a uh, very simple and silly contradiction when we came down here um, that I just want to share with you. I find it very crazy. Um, it, when you get on a plane and you're flying, and you have all this technology around you, and you're very thankful for that technology because you want that plane to fly right, land right, do everything it needs to do. And they even have the entertainment systems now in planes, you know, you can plug in. You listen to the music, and it's clear. You watch the television, you can hear just fine. But when the, the captain gets on the intercom, or one, when one of the people, the stewards or stewardess, gets on the intercom, you can't hear a thing. And you just think, how does this, how can we have so much technology? How can we have so much precision on this aircraft? But when the, the, you know, the pilot gets on and say, well, it's very important that everyone did And for your safety, we ask that you, and whatever you do, just make sure you don't. And you're just saying, how come I can listen to the music and it's clear as a bell? And the, the television and, and the videos are just fine, but they can't seem to figure out how to make that system work. Maybe you have better hearing than I, but to me, that's a contradiction. How, how is that possible? So many of these things. Again, that's silly and trite and irrelevant. Where does the church fit today? How do we fit as a people in this contradictory, chaotic, and crazy time? You know, we... It wasn't too long ago we as Adventists could preach about the chaos uh, of our world just because of seeing the degradation of morals and everything else. But we're just in a whole new level of trying to understand society. Something I, I never predicted. I don't think many people did. But I have a question for you, and I hope I can illustrate this in a way that, that makes sense. Uh, I'm wondering if you will um, do a little activity with me for just a moment. And I, I ask for your participation. If you're watching from home, just humor me maybe. I want you to do something. Would you close your eyes for just a second? Just, just for a moment. Close your eyes. Now, just for a moment. You may have done this before. Maybe this is the first time. I don't know. But I want you to do something. Picture the perfect church. The perfect church. So well, what do you mean, Pastor? What do you, do you mean like the perfect, uh, you know, uh, services or the perfect? No, whatever that means to you, picture the perfect church, whatever that means to you. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What does that church mean? Do that makes it perfect. All right, come back to me. Hypnotism's over. Come on back. <laughs> now, think for a moment, and let's, let's just discuss this. What was it in your mind? What was it in your mind's eye or in your heart as you contemplated that? What came to mind? I'm not, you know, just as simply for your own, you know, thinking and I'm not exactly taking polls here today or taking a vote. Was it the music that made it the perfect? Was that where your heart went? That, yeah, man, when the music is just, whew, that's it. There's nothing wrong with music. Don't get me wrong. Maybe that was your first thing. Was it that, that the pastor was extremely handsome? Oh, yeah, sorry. Can't help you there. 
Was it that the uh, church had the modern technology, the strobe light and the fog machine and everything just happening and the, you know, everything was just glitzy and glamoury? Was it that everyone was dressed just right? I mean, clean cut, looking sharp, and there were no you know, uh, uh, outsiders that looked a little shaggy. Was that? Now you laugh, but you know, I, I visit a lot of churches, and uh, Dr. Ramirez, I know you go in a lot of churches, and it doesn't take long when you walk into a church sometimes. You get to experience what their expectations are. Was it its comfort? How clean it was? What makes a church a great church? What are we striving for as a people? What are we trying to create and grow? Was it a loving church? And you know, each of us are going to define that in a different way, how we experience love and what it means. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the bride. There's so many ways in which Scripture speaks about this organization, this movement, this people. But the church is not a building. The church is not programs. It's not a comfortable set of practices that we're used to or maintaining traditions and habits. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. Comfort is fine. Even certain traditions that still have validity or not contrary to Scripture, of course, are fine. In God's church, everyone loves and nobody judges, right? The strong support the weak. The rich assist the needy. It's safe. Did maybe the, the concept of safety come to any of your minds? It's a safe place safe spiritually safe physically safe emotionally it's a it's a people who live in harmony a little slice of heaven again your mind may have gone in different ways of putting it in different images but i would submit to you that we know we are in god's church when it's a loving place that's doing two things when the saints are maturing and being grown and discipled, and the lost are being found. Now, there's a hundred different ways we could put this. There's all different methodologies. There's all different illustrations that Scripture uses and, and, and that we could turn to to see these. But in my mind, this is the simplest way of, of harnessing this idea of what the church means to me as I see it exemplified in Scripture. And if you think of any organization, think of, think of a, a, a great hospital. What makes a hospital great? It's where patients are cared for and the staff love what they do, right? That's what a great, if, if you go to a hospital where the patients are, are all not succeeding and, and dying and everyone's miserable, you say, that's not the best place that I want my loved one to go when they're sick. Right? I want to go where patients are surviving, and the staff love what they do. What makes a great school, right? It's where the students are successful and the staff are confident about what they're doing. The two go together, right? You don't want to send your kids to a school where no one seems to be successful and all the staff are miserable, right? So well, that, that, that doesn't seem right. Even in business, what makes a great business? What makes a business successful? It's when the clients are satisfied and the employees love what they're doing. And you really have to have these two concepts together. The same is true in the church. What makes a great church? What makes it something that God has called it to be? It's where people are finding hope in Jesus Christ and they're accepting the Lord and they're feeling the, the guilt of sin fall off of their shoulders. And they're growing into disciples of Christ. Grow the saints. Jesus did not just seek to save the lost. He took along with him, almost from the very beginning of his ministry, people that we know as disciples. Simply means someone under the discipline of a master. Someone trying to become like the master. He made it his mission to raise and empower believers with the message of the gospel, to grow them, to see that they mature in their beliefs, their behaviors, their love for God and man. Jesus was intensely interested in discipling, in discipling. His followers understood this and made this part of their mission in the church. All throughout the New Testament, 
The author is right about perfecting holiness in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And holiness simply means to be like God. And what was God like? John says he is love. So we want to become like God. We want to become like that who is love. We want to grow in grace and knowledge, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.18. We need to grow until we come to the measure of Christ, Ephesians 4.13 says. The role of the leadership of the church is to equip the saints. It's another concept of discipling in Ephesians 4.12. We need to move from the milk to the solid food, Hebrews chapter 5 teaches us. We need to be made complete, mature, even perfect. 2 Corinthians 3, 9, 13, 9 can be translated. We need to be pressing on to maturity, Hebrews 6, 1 teaches. So a major part of the work of the church is to grow the people of God. To see that they don't just stay where they're at from the day that they accepted Christ, that they're actually becoming more like the person of Jesus Christ. In God's church, people are growing. Growing to be more loving, more selfless, more giving, more like the master who we call Jesus Christ. Secondly, and you say, well, that seems, that's fine, and, and I understand that, but why did you put that one first and not seeking the loss? We normally think of the mission of the church primarily as seeking the loss, but really these two go hand in hand. You don't really have a first or a last because if the church is truly growing, they will have the heart of Christ who made it his mission to seek the lost. Seeking the lost will become natural. It won't have to be an imposed structure upon the church. Now, what are we supposed to do? I forgot. Let's see. I was with the Lord in prayer this morning, but I just seem to have lost what it... No, no. When you're growing into Jesus Christ, into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, your beat hearts, your heart beats, excuse me. Your heart beats with the same thing that made the heart of the Lord beat. He cared desperately and deeply for everyone and desired that they all come to the knowledge of salvation. In Matthew 18, 11, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Luke 19.10 puts it a little bit differently. Uh, Luke says, Jesus has come to, or Jesus said of himself, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Makes it very clear that that was his mission. And if we're growing to be like him, it's our mission as well. Jesus did not just build a commune of faithful disciples. The whole history of, of really the, the North American development of civil, civilization as those were coming over for, from Europe was those seeking to be apart from those they disagreed with and creating a commune of perfection. Uh, most of the uh, uh, westward uh, momentum of those leaving the East Coast and breaking out into the Western territories were those who were saying, look, I, I don't really want to be amount, around those Presbyterians. I'm Methodist. Let's get a group of Methodists together, and we're going to go over and plant this town, and we're going to have a perfect Methodist town, and we're just going to be wonderful together. The Amish did that. The Mormons did that. Everyone did that. It's a major part of American history, and it's wrong. And by the way, they all failed. Every single one of them failed. They did not create a perfect commune. You don't want to know why? Because they were human. And humanity is something that we cannot escape from except by the power of Jesus Christ and submission to him as a community of believers. Jesus did not say build a commune, remove yourself from society and say, shh, this is just for you, don't tell anybody. He discipled his followers by seeking the lost, the hurting, the destitute, the sick, the poor, the downtrodden, the disabled, the willing, the open-hearted sinners. And that's our mission. That is what a godly church is doing. There's many ships that make up the armada of the church. There's fellowship and there's stewardship and there's membership, and there's leadership. There's all these ships that we're all a part of. We're all sailing together. But discipleship is the key aspect 
that the church is supposed to be fostering. And in so doing, a heart for the lost grows and beats. And we become more like Christ who died on a cross to show how much he cared about me and you. Everyone who drives, let's see, Scottsdale's on this side, right? Everyone who drives down Scottsdale and everyone in this community that we're surrounded by. And Jesus passed on this two-part mission to the church in his great commission in Matthew 28 when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Isn't it interesting that he put that first? Go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Disciples that have the power and the calling and the name and the image of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit imbued within them. And then he goes on to say, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. When you really break it down, that mission is there, disciple and save, teach and baptize. That's what I've exemplified as your Lord and Savior. That's what the Lord did when he came. He raised up disciples, taught them how to break free from the chains and burden of sin, and taught them how to love others more than themselves. When a church does that, that's where I want to be when you really love to learn, when you've really learned to love others more than yourself. George read the verse earlier, and I'll close with it here. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, kind of encapsulated this idea. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time... We will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, and boy, let me tell you, at no other time that I've ever been alive and been in ministry is the opportunity greater than right now. People are seeking answers right now. Sometimes in ways we don't appreciate. Sometimes through violence and division and, and things that we just can't understand. But that really is a cry for answers. While we have opportunity, let us do good. That's the offering. Let us offer ourselves. Let us do good to all people. And that certainly is true, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I look forward to to getting to know you. I look forward to worshiping with you, journeying with you, and seeing how God is going to lead us on this path together. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, all of us, Lord, are in need of a greater revelation of yourself than we've ever had before. Now more than ever, the devil is doing all that he can to distract, discourage, and prevent people from seeing your beauty and truth. And God, what a, what a time in which we live to be a part of your church. No, Lord, we are not perfect. And on this side of the kingdom, what perfection will look like is something far short of what it will look like when you return. But God, we know that through your power, you can raise us up individually and as a people to really love with your heart and to see your mission accomplished in this church, in this school, in this community. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.